All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Welcome to the Ambrook Literary Arts Center. Welcome to the Wanda Coleman Theater. Uh, my name is Quentin Ring. I'm the Ambrook's executive director. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming out on what is a cold, probably soon to be rainy day. Um, we were sort of originally we had planned this to be on a beautiful spring day. We could be out in the garden, but it is what it is. Um, but we're very glad to have you all here because this is a very special afternoon for us. Uh, and that's for a few reasons. Um, the first is that we're here to remember and celebrate the great Linda J. Albertano, poet, performance artist, filmmaker, uh, painter, just about, uh, just about everything, uh, and an absolutely beloved member of this community. Uh, I feel a little bad interrupting Linda, the videos uh, of whom you can see on screen. Um, but her birthday is April 17th. Uh, she passed away in September of 2022, um, and so we're still we're here to say happy birthday to her, um, to remember her. We have with us a few of the poets that were closest to Linda: uh, S. A. Griffin, Laurel Ann Bogan, Suzanne Lummis, Brendan Constantine. Um, they're going to read some of Linda's poetry as well as some of their own. But we're also here to introduce and celebrate the recipient of a new fellowship uh, in Linda's honor, named in Linda's honor. Uh, we have with us here, too, the remarkable Abby Page. Uh, give it up for Abby, please. <laughs> Abby is the inaugural, inaugural Linda J. Albertano Fellow. Uh, so in a little bit, we're going to introduce Abby. Uh, she's going to read, and we'll have a little reception afterwards. Um, before we get to all that, however, I want to say a few words uh, about Beyond Baroque, about the fellowship. Um, I want to start by acknowledging Beyond Baroque's presence here on Tongva land. Tongva were the first peoples of this land, and we acknowledge the wrong done to them through colonialism, uh, genocidal practices, and the violent dispossession of their land. As an arts organization, Beyond Baroque is committed to uplifting indigenous writers, poets, and their communities. Uh, Beyond Baroque itself, as many of you know, is Los Angeles' oldest literary institution. We were founded in 1968 by George Jury Smith, and for 56 years we have nurtured poets, writers, and artists, and pretty much anyone committed to expanding the artistic possibilities of language. Um, from Mike Kelly and Viggo Mortensen to Wanda Coleman and Amanda Gorman, our workshops, exhibitions, readings, performance series have given talented poets and artists support, feedback, uh, and a sense of community at crucial junctures in their career. We have a theater, as you can see, we have a bookstore, we have an archive, we have an art gallery, uh, and we have a huge and growing community. Um, the legacy of that community is, is still very much ongoing today. Uh, we have free weekly workshops, we have regular paid workshops, we have art exhibitions, we have readings, we have performances pretty much every weekend right here in this theater. Um, I encourage everyone to check out those workshops, uh, exhibitions, and, and our performance series um, in a couple weeks. Next week, we'll be taking a break for the LA Times Festival of Books. We'll be over um, at USC for that. But in a couple weeks, we have the International Poetry Film Festival in Los Angeles. Um, there'll be two days of poem-based films, uh, including um, the classic documentary Life is a Saxophone, which is about the founder of the world stage, Kamal Daoud. Um, that should be a, just a great festival, so please come back for that. Um, and just check out what we have going on all year. This day, however, is the start of something new for us. Uh, Linda Albertano was a titanic artistic presence, presence in this space as a poet, as a performer, as an artist. Uh, when she passed away, we wanted to make sure her utterly fearless spirit remained active in this space and really uh, out in the world as well. Um, so with the incredibly generous support of Linda's husband, Frank Lutz, we have launched the Linda J. Albertano Poetry Fellowship, which every year will give women and non-binary emerging poets the opportunity to take workshops for free at Beyond Baroque, to curate programs here, and to facilitate our historic Wednesday night workshop. Um, I can't imagine a better way to honor Linda than to make, uh, than to have new poets um, get the opportunity to develop their arts, uh, meet community, develop new programs, um, and generally um, grow as artists. Um, so I would just like to get into the program. Um, we're, we're here welcoming some old friends as part of this program, um, and then we'll welcome Abby to the stage in a bit. Um, 
So my final couple things I just wanted to say is just a few words of thanks. Uh, the first is to Beyond Broke's staff, including Ivan Salinas, Michelle Raphael's, Raphael, Genesis Perez, uh, especially Eric Alberg, who's running the tech in the booth, and most especially our associate director, Jimmy Vega, who is uh, really overseeing this fellowship. He's done a huge amount of work on it. Yes. Um, thank you. Sorry, I'm sniffling up here too. It's so unexpectedly cold out there. I'm like, um, but um, I also really want to thank Cal Private Bank, uh, who has very generously sponsored this event and whose support is helping us to nurture the next generation of poets and writers as they bring their art into the world. Um, thank you especially to Blanca Alfaro, who I think is going to be here if she's not here already, um, and to the whole bank's support. Um, but above all, I want to thank Frank Lutz, who has made this fellowship possible with a very generous donation. I worked closely with Frank uh, for a while now, and I have to say he's remarkable in every, every way. Um, I find it deeply touching. He met Linda in 1968, which is the same year Beyond Baroque was founded, and they were together ever since. Um, so he's here to say a few words about Linda, uh, to read some of her work, talk about the fellowship a little bit. So please, everybody, welcome Frank Lutz. Thank you, Quentin. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming today. So it's a wonderful experience for me to be able to honor Linda. She. Uh, she went too early, and everybody knows that. <clears throat> and uh, I have a few people I'd like to thank. First of all, I'd like to thank um, <clears throat> Mr. Alec Carmona back there in the corner, who is our tech guy on the, working on the book. <clears throat> and wonderful Deborah, Deborah Granger, who's a publisher and an editor, and is a ter terrific person, and she couldn't be here today. She got car trouble, and it broke down this morning, and so she's, she's wrestling with that. Uh, but she really wanted to be here. Uh, Scott Wardlaw, who's a fellow who uh, lives out in the east of East LA, who used to drive in here to help us with the archives and get all of Linda's paperwork together. And, uh, and um, the wonderful lady in, in New York, excuse my voice, I've been talking so much to poets, I can hardly talk myself. <laughs> and so, uh, you, most of you probably know, <coughs> excuse me, Cat Georges and her husband, Peter Karloftis. They live in New York. They're Dada poets. <clears throat> They're two of the leaders of the two, the two leaders of the Dada movement here in the United States. And they were pals with Linda for over 20 years. And they loved her and she loved them. And they're wonderful people. And during the time we uh, put the book together, by the way, Alex, can you bring me a copy of the books? I, I don't know where I left mine. I, there might be one out on the, out on the desk. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I got it. I got it, Alex. Thanks, man. Um, one of the things I decided we wanted to do after Linda passed away was do a book of her poetry. And before she passed away, she would said she wanted to do a book of poetry of mine and hers together, because she loved my poetry. So this is the book, and it's uh, for sale now. Uh, we're just getting it printed. Uh, but it's full of a lot of, I've got, I got one, thanks, Alex. It's full of a lot of beautiful uh, photographs and, and newspaper articles about Linda, plus our poetry. And I, I think it's really a great book. Um, I wanted to do a book about Linda, and I wanted to get, gather her archives because there are museums out there who look for archives on artists who've done so well. And uh, Linda Mindy was prominent in four arts, poetry, performance art, music, and film. And um, so Cat George is back in New York, um, who has been on, performed on this stage here with her husband uh, and Linda. Uh, she uh, also edited the book and uh, put it in. She's a bookmaker. She's a person who designs them and puts them together. And she's terrific, and she's a wonderful person. So uh, those are the people who I want to thank for helping me with this. Um, also, I want to thank Beyond Baroque. Uh, they've been really great to work with. And Quentin is just a primo guy. He's very intelligent. He's very easy to work. Very easygoing guy and very knowledgeable, and I want to thank the board for, uh, Beyond Baroque too for understanding this whole this whole process and what we were doing. So let's give the board of directors a call. <laughs> We've got coming up some unbelievably superb poets this afternoon. We're going to have Suzanne Lummis and Laurel Ann Bogan. Those those two fine ladies were best pals with Linda, and the three of them are the ones who founded and made happen. The, uh, the Nearly Fatal Women, and they performed all over the North American continent. And um, 
it's, it's great to see them. They would do comedy, they would do drama, they would do the whole thing, and they're, they're published books, and they're just wonderful people. And they're here today, Laurel Ann and Suzanne. So uh, where are you? There you go. There you go. Give them a hand. And we're going to have we're going to have Brendan Constantine. He's going to be here at some point, and a lot of you know who Brendan is. We're, and then we're going to have we're going to have the, the amazing hold your socks on S. A. Griffin. He's going to read. He's going to read. He's going to read Linda's great poem to the Pacific. Um, I'm going to read you a poem, and then I'll sit down and enjoy the show. Uh, I had written three poems recently, and I couldn't decide which one I wanted to bring. This is a prose poem. I, uh, it's a prose poem. I've written both prose poem poetry and also rhyming poetry, not, not iambic pentameter. Thank you very much. But, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, I've been writing poetry for a long time. Um, <clears throat> it's remarkable to me when I think back five and one and a half decades ago that she would pick me up hitchhiking in her 53 Mercury Coupe on a cold and rainy evening, the kind of things that kids did back then to help each other, and that Linda and I would stay together for five and one half decades and love each other more each year, each year, each year, until the day she left this earth. But we knew our love for each other would go on and on, and it does. Linda more recently on, in our years together told me, Frank, it was preordained as she remarked on how strongly we felt about each other. We were alike and unalike. This sentiment was felt and believed by me too. Shortly in our knowing each other back then, I would find out she was a poet. I was a poet too, but it would be years before I told her that, as I never wanted her to, feel, to think that I might compete with her for recognition. She found out anyway. She had discovered and read my th thick portfolio of poems. I had been writing poetry since I had been traveling around the world on oceanographic ships, a young student scientist stopping in places like Africa, India, islands in the far oceans, or studying in universities in Europe. Over time, of course, Linda would present her poetry and performance art all across America and on three continents. She would become recognized and acclaimed for her work in poetry, performance art, music and film. Sometime before COVID, she said to me, Hanky, I want us to pu publish a book of poetry together. I love your poems. I said, you love my poems? Why? She looked at me with her usual sweet face and said, because they make people cry. I, di I didn't know what to say. <laughs> then COVID hit and then the world seemed to stop for a while <clears throat> after it was pretty much over on April 7, 2022. Linda woke up that morning and said to me, Hanky, I feel a lump in my tummy. I think we should go to the doctor. I replied, absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cheers. <clears throat> I replied, absolutely. <clears throat> and we went. <clears throat> Excuse me. The news was not good. It was all about her pancreas. During the next five months, we tried everything available and conventional. <clears throat> Excuse me. I gotta find the next page. In conventional and alternative medicine, <clears throat> to no avail. <clears throat> we got married for the second time on Tuesday, September 6th, and on Tuesday, September 13th, my dear sweet Linda, love of my life, passed away at 4.40 in the morning. Now all three of the people I loved most, mom, dad, and Linda, were all gone from Mother Earth. But it is not over. After she passed, I knew she would be as desperate to talk to me as I would be to talk to her. And so I went on yet another long journey of discovery. I needed to study afterlife communications with scientists, medical people, researchers, medium practitioners, people who have had near-death experiences, and people who have had the sublime experience of talking with their departed loved ones. I've also read more than 57 books on the subjects, starting with quantum mechanics science. Truth be told, I can now communicate with my Linda almost on a daily basis. Some of you will understand this. Some of you will not and will want to understand it. And some of you will treat what, what I say with skepticism. But I am happy to pass on to you all anything I can to help you. Linda would have it no other way. And believe me, if I were not to help you, I would hear about it from Linda, from Linda. Thank you.
I'll be around for a while if anybody has any questions. Um, so we talked about the, the scholarship. We're going to a bright young lady who's going to get the scholarship this afternoon, and she's a Phi Beta Kappa as am I from the university. And Phi Beta Kappa is the top scholarship uh, organization, uh, club, however you want to call it, in in America. Phi Beta Kappa has been that way since 1774, before we were a nation, honoring scholars. So she's a sharp one, and she, you'll get to hear from her later on this afternoon. So. That's it for me. And uh, who am I bringing up first? Was it going to be Laurel Ann or Suzanne? Suzanne. Oh. <laughs> All right. The, the great Suzanne Lummis has arrived. All right. Thank you, Frank, uh, for for preserving all that great video on Linda. I just, it gives me so many feelings to, to watch those performances. I'm so glad they're still with us. Uh, I am going to read a poem by Linda, short one, uh, one by me, and uh, an excerpted one of her. I am going to read one of her top smash hits, who many of you have heard before. Does everybody agree with this? I, I, I'm going to see if this is controversial, or does everybody agree? In dark times, do we need beautiful love poems? Yes. Good. Okay. We're all on the same page. Beloved, thou art incendiary. Thou sendest me up in sparks a hundred times a day. Thou makest me hum like one thousand buzzing phone lines yammering through dizzy night. When thou smilest upon me, I am money in the bank. When thou snarlest, I am as a bad check bounced and cowering in thy heart's darkest dumpster. Thou art the lion of Sienega, the rose of Sherman Way. I love to lay eyes on thee. Thou ringest through me sudden and white as fresh champagne. My switchboard overloadeth thy breath is as clean laundry folded behind thy lips. Thy teeth art white Cadillacs parked in neat rows. I love that line. I love to taste the texture of thy skin. Thine eyes art interstellar. Beloved, Thou art incendiary. Thou sendest me up in sparks. It's very hard to read her work and keep my hands at my side. I mean, I just they just start wanting to kind of reach out and yeah. Um, okay, uh, I forgot to tell everybody something very important, the most important piece of information I have to give you tonight, these earrings. Some people have commented on these earrings, like for instance, Gloria Bando did. Are you out there? Yes. Well, yeah, there you are. And isn't it true that you have commented right away? You notice these earrings before you even notice me, right? You just saw the earrings. Um, these were Linda's. And she left these for me. And she left these for me along with some other beautiful, exquisite things. Um, she was a very tall woman. So when I first put them on, I thought, do these really fit me, or do I need to be a foot taller for these to look right on me? Um, I'm going to read a poem that I think she would like. She paid me one of a compliment I treasure, and it was in the last months of her life before I knew, before she knew, before anybody knew uh, that these were her last months. And she knew how politically active I've been. 
and so do Bill and Linda. No, right? Bill and Linda. Also, Steve and Susan out there. Where are you? Raise your hands. They know, because I was just talking about, I was just raving on before this show began. And Linda knew and uh, wrote a beautiful piece about my performance here of Tweets from Hell about somebody. Her name will not be mentioned. And uh, she wrote a beautiful piece about it and was published in Poetry Flash. You can still go there and find it on Online. And the last great compliment I remember her paying to me is I was qualifying something I said. I was going, no, I don't mean this. I'm trying to say that. And she burst out with great affection and great exuberance. And she said, oh, there is no doubt about it. You are the real thing. You are a great American patriot. <laughs> and I just went, sometimes I deny compliments, I go, oh no, not really, I'm not all that great, I'm not that, and this time I just went, damn straight, I'll take it, I'll take it, I treasure that. Um, this poem, The Big Babies, is after a poem by Mark Strand, a very famous poem at one time, I don't know if it's still true, probably not, at one time you couldn't run into a poet anywhere who didn't know The Babies by Mark Strand. And the refrain of it goes a little bit like this, we must save the babies, let us hurry, let us run to downtown, you will wear mink and your hair will be done, I will put on a tie, the babies are screaming, they lie in warehouses, the door are iron, the windows are barred, um, let us hurry, and so on. It keeps going on that way. And mine is a, uh, takes that refrain and does something else with it. Uh, it does anybody here know Ionesco's rhinostrus? <laughs> Remember how many people start turning into rhinostruses one by one? Starts with stomping their foot and snorting and then slowly. Uh, Ionesco wrote that, I think in Romania or about Romania, when the Iron Guard, the fascist uh, group, the Iron Guard, and if I might be wrong, but I think it was in Romania, began to rise up and he began to lose his friends one by one. Things to know about this poem. The last thing to know is that when I say wines, it's not W I N E S, it's W H I N E S. The Big Babies, after The Babies by Mark Strand. Let us save the big babies. Let us vacate our premises and head east nimbly as possible. The big babies are subscribing to their own ideas, filling their own big shoes. Let us Hurry to the white hill where they accrue in large numbers, bubbling in the feeding bowls of themselves. They are fomenting plans. I will don a wreath of spring lilies and a gossamer gown. You will spruce yourself up. Let our bodies take flight. The big babies sit trapped in their skin. They grew, but it failed to stretch. What can save the big babies? The fabled cow toy of the Andalusians? A milk bomb from the gurgling fen? Let us hurry. We must drop what we're doing. A small item flies from my purse. No searching for mislaid things. There is no time to look back. They are shifting and grouping. They have appointed a leader, king of the big babies. It is almost too late. What can calm the big babies? The lost teething ring of the last golem? Play money that can pass for counterfeit? They think some winning will save them. They believe some losing is winning. We must sprint faster. Nothing is certain. No one is safe. One contagion is airborne. They sicken and die or recover. One contagion is thought-born, angry, colicky. The infected start to resemble each other. Let our strides become leaps, arcing and graceful. Let your legs churn in the wind. No, we're arriving too slowly, too late. Already choice words fall away. My mind begins to close like a nut. Let us, let us say, let us say, let us say, let us say, please.
Go on without me. No. No. I'm fine. I am good. He is great. Okay. A dark and depressing poem. All right, here's a lively poem. I am going to, when I read this poem, I feel myself um, a little bit slipping into Linda's voice, and I can't do it the great way that she did it. But I can't read this without slipping a little bit into her voice that I know so well. Uh, virtue. And uh, Deborah first published this, I think. Yeah, Deborah, who uh, uh, Frank gave a shout out to. Virtue. Virtue rides into town on a convertible Clydesdale. She's wrapped in blue and white stars and is eating an apple concoction. Ah, virtue, they want you. Your symbols are so suck. They want to use you for purposes of personal adornment. They want to pin you wholesome and lovely to their lapels. Virtue drinks nothing but water from glaciers and the sap of lace bark pine. Ah, virtue, you're deep in danger of becoming a dull boy. Everyone knows the most fascinating females are hookers with hearts of gold. They smoke their cheroots and sing in their whiskey tenors. They wear flamingo lipstick and kiss your boyfriend on the mouth. Oh, virtue, Run, run before they snare you in their pious and hellish nets. Save yourself, virtue. They want to use you for purposes of narcissism. They want to turn you upside down and imprison you in their green and glorious gore. Their hounds are howling in the hills. Hide, be the purloined letter, virtue. They can't hurt you if they can't see you. They can't see you if you're everywhere. Be everywhere, virtue. Be nowhere. Be something. Be nothing. Hide. Ride out of town on a white Clydesdale. Ah, virtue, we love your girlish ways. Don't ever change. Suzanne Lamas, everyone, another round of applause. <laughs> Next up, we have the great Laurel Ann Bogan. Please give it up for Laurel Ann. with my cat, Beowulf. Oh, no. He tripped me and I broke my ankle in two parts. And I just, I've been out for three months. I haven't been able to, anyway, but I'm back now, so. That's, you know, Linda was perhaps the most remarkable person I've ever met. And it was an honor to be her friend. I'm going to begin with, this is one of her pieces that, um, well, it's one of my favorites. And we did it in Nearly Fatal Women. And it's called Busy. 
I am so busy, she said. I've been really terribly, terribly busy. You have? <laughs> Remarked her friend. Why? What? A coincidence. I've been busy too. <laughs> I've been very busy. Why, I've been extremely, extraordinarily busy. You've been busy said a third party who was simply eavesdropping on the street. You think you've been busy? Let me tell you what busy is. I'm busy. I'm a very busy person. I have been so busy. Why, this year I have been busier than I have ever been all other years put together. Just in the few months, barely, you can't imagine how frightening it is not to be able to have time to get down to the discount, discount app store. I mean, that's how very busy I've been. Oh, yeah, said her friend. Well, I have been too busy to have my smartphone respond to your insulting tweets. Oh, yeah, retorted the first to speak. Well, let me tell you this. I have been too busy even to take lunch. I get my meals through an intravenous hookup. <laughs> Next to my desk where I work at TikTok. <laughs> oh, yeah. Meanwhile, I've been doing 120 miles an hour on the Poetry Superhighway. Catch me if you can, copper. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, let me tell you how busy I've been. I have been frighteningly astoundingly, shockingly busy with my very busy, frightening, shocking, and astounding schedule. There isn't one piece of light that can shine through any crack in my schedule because I am just, I'm, I've, 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 but that's just how busy I am. <laughs> Besides, I am such a busy person. I have been really, really busy. I have been, I've been busier than you can imagine. No one knows how busy I've been. I've been busier than the speed of light. I've been really, really, really busy. I mean, I'm busy. I am so busy. I'm, I'm, wait, I don't know. I don't know how to explain how busy I am. I'm really, really busy. I'm very busy, but I'm, ooh, help. No, wait, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I've been very busy. I'm a very busy, busy person. Busy, busy, busy. Don't you understand? I mean busy, and I mean busy. I'm not kidding. I'm serious. I mean busy. Really busy, busy, busy. Wait. Oh, stop. Oh, help. Somebody help me. Somebody, somebody stop me. Stop me. Stop me. Stop me before I do one more thing. <laughs> I, I would like, if you love the poetry of Linda Albertano, there's a beautiful book that came out today, and it really is a, a masterpiece of love. So I would highly recommend to get one in the bookstore. And I'm just going to read one of my poems, one. 
called Live Steam at 8.45. In this poem, there are no words. All language has stopped, but the pumps boil. Live steam, live steam, live steam from the inside. Hearts poach, we rip at skin alone and without noise to get at the beat, the color, or where the words are. But this is a poem where there are no words and all the colors are extinct, rising like steam that hisses in our throats like wordless lies. In this poem, the words sizzle and evaporate. In this poem, the words rise crazy. In this poem, our bodies ache. Our fingers can murder us, but even though we fear death, we offer each other to ourselves. Our bodies can also heal. This poem cradles in its palm those things that cannot be said. It asks that you touch this page. Thank you. Please give it up again for Laurel Ann. The first appearance since coming back from a broken ankle. Next up, we have Brendan Constantine. Please, everybody, welcome Brendan. Hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. Do you need the 16 font? No, uh, no, I've got it. I've got the poem right here, and I've got it in 16 point font. Thank you for that. Uh, it's really, it's really quite wonderful. Uh, <laughs> There's a light in my face, and I can't see any of you. Uh, I, can see you. I can see little shapes, though. You look like one very complex form of sea life uh, right now. Uh, hi. So dig. It's 19, I think 1998, when Suzanne and Laurel Ann asked me to help out with the Nearly Fatal Women Tour. It was 98, wasn't it? And uh, so I get to, that's how I meet Linda Albertano, right? Uh, I get sort of dumped into this. I knew Laurel Ann, I knew Suzanne, and uh, they said, we're doing this show and we're working with these other poets. Linda Albertano, and if that wasn't enough, and don't you think it ought to be, they'd also had Anna Homler uh, working. And the four of them were that particular iteration of the Nearly Fatal Woman. And they, you know, Suzanne had said, you know, maybe you could help us like with the segues between poems and things. And I got to sort of assume this uh, identity of a kind of butler. I had a jacket with tails and a red vest, and I would help transitions between uh, the sequences. And just as we were getting ready to do a show here, I got hurt at work, and I, I ended up just bashing my head. Nothing looks stupider than a bald guy with a Band-Aid on his head, you know, except maybe a big fly or something, right? You know what I mean? And um, so I had to show up to work with them, and I had, I kid you not, like a big cartoon white cross bandage on my head, and I'm thinking like this sort of ruins what it's gonna look like. Linda, you know, was one of those artists though that will use whatever is at hand, you know, which I think is really part of the spirit of this of this uh, fellowship, you know, is the writer that, you know, is, is inventive, is going to show us the next surprising thing. Linda looked at the wound on my head, she went, Perfect. That's awesome. Like, can you keep that? And and um, she said, "The show's the nearly fatal women. Of course, our butler has a serious head wound. You know, <laughs> like you know, you know. That's part. You know. And you know what? I still regret is then you guys went on tour, and I had a job at the time, and you had even said like I could maybe go on the tour, and I like was like, God, I'm gonna have to like, I hate my job, but like, what if I lose it? You know." And I was like really thinking like I should quit it and go on tour. And I made the mistake of asking a reasonable person, should I do this? And he said, no, man, hang on to your, I've still regretted not going on the train with you cats. I really wish I had, but it really would have, it was, that was such a blast. But that was my introduction 
to, you know, <laughs> Linda was, can you keep it? You know, um, anyway. <laughs> This, uh, yeah, and then she just blew my mind. And then I saw her first performance, I saw her give. Uh, I want, I can't, I could go, I could just spend the rest of the evening describing it, but I just, you know, if you can imagine a poetry reading that starts with somebody coming out with a bunch of flashlights and highball glasses, and she would set the highball glasses upside down. All the lights are out in this theater, and she'd set highball glasses upside down and then upend flashlights over them. So that all of a sudden, where you're sitting in the audience, there appear to be these amazing constellations that are suddenly forming on the floor because they are, the highball glasses are diffusing the light in different directions. And then she just sort of glided out among them wearing a headlamp and began to recite. It was, I mean, I'm still changed. Anyways, um, <laughs> Linda Albertano, man. This is Linda Albertano's Good Americans. Good Americans are kind to dogs and children. Good Americans give to the thoroughly needy. Good Americans are massively patriotic. Fine Americans express such tender sympathies. Good Americans have never harmed a living creature. Good Americans lead basically blameless lives. Good Americans are proud of their personal karmas. Upstanding Americans never hear the screams. Good Americans tend to their own little gardens. Good Americans don't count their pit bulls before they've hatched. Good Americans breed BMWs for pleasure. Responsible Americans never drive home through Watts. Good Americans know that nothing is sacred but style. Good Americans shop on eBay or Amazon or Saks. Good Americans own smartphones and Second Amendment attack drones. But loyal Americans own no lampshades of human flesh. Good Americans are aggressively apathetic. Good Americans can't hear the children scream. Good Americans make a business of keeping their hands clean. God-fearing Americans are only doing their jobs. Good Americans are not their brother's keepers. Good Americans wear blindfolds on their blindfolds. Good Americans have front row seats in heaven. Decent Americans don't hear the tortured screams. Good Americans ask only that God grant them the serenity to accept things they cannot change and the ability to ignore the things they can. Good Americans. This won't take long. I, you know, of course, I mean, how the hell do I respond to that? How do I respond to Linda? You know, uh, my love, uh, Julia, helped me figure out what the heck I was going to read with this and, uh, you know, decided on a poem whose themes were poetry itself, love and loneliness, and uh, a good measure of hope. This is called Tomorrow. Last year alone, people bought more poetry than ever. Last year alone, more people jumped from windows. Last year alone, artists were blamed for more art. Most of these felt they'd spent last year alone. A man walks into a doctor's office and says, Doctor, I feel like a painting of a man in a doctor's office. The doctor says, Please stand against this wall. <laughs> Last year alone, every child between two and four wrote a novel using only three words. Last year alone, every great writer said, peekaboo. <laughs> a doctor walks into a man's house and cries, help me, I feel wonderful. <laughs> the man puts his arms around him and says, tell me where it feels good. Last year alone, there were fewer murders, but more non-consensual deaths. The papers moaned, alone, alone. Last year alone, the average criminal averaged out. A man and his doctor fall in love. At the wedding, guests are told to wait outside until a nurse can call them in, one at a time. Later, everyone leaves with a lollipop. This is our last year alone, they say. This is our last year alone. Thank you so much.
up the team. All right, and now we have S.A. Griffin, who's here to read Linda's iconic poem to the Pacific, which a fragment of which is preserved on the Venice Beach Poets Monument. Uh, go check it out sometime. Well, here we have in full S.A. Griffin reading to the Pacific. And uh, I am, these words are too glib, but I am honored to be here. I really am honored to be here. I don't even know how long I've known Linda. It just seemed like she was always a part of my life the whole time I was involved with all you people here. She's just was, you know, she was always wonderful. She was always brilliant. She was always beautiful. Um, thank you, Dion. Yeah. Thank you, Dion Burroughs. Thank you, Frank. Uh, very, 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 this is longer than my poem. And then I'm gonna do Linda's. Voting rights. The rule of law. Women. I have been alive too long, a stranger in a strange land. To the Pacific by Linda J. Albertano. To the Pacific, who is older than wisdom, who is shrinking like the slow death of thought, who is caught in a storm behind our ribs, who finds her rhythm in the delirious heartbeat of night. It is dark. Where were we when the lights went out? Who poured the last round? It's dark. It gets dark in here fast. To the Pacific, who throbs in our improbable bodies, who breathes us in and out, who sings between Earth and Orion, who makes us feel taller than trees, who suffers the weight of our pain, who's been trained to submit to our whims, whom we'd bring to her knees if she had them, who's been trapped in a terminal brothel, whom we've cast in an X-rated movie and we're waiting to watch her bleed. It's dark. By the nature of our deeds, we're dirty. We're bound in our own senseless chains. It's dark. How long can this last? It's sad. Is it criminal or criminally insane? It's dark in here. It gets dark in here fast to the Pacific, who surprised us with the curious invention of life, whose intentions were purely honorable, who stirred our first shimmering cells, who helped us crawl up on her shores, whose blood still roars in our ears, whom we've caged like a laboratory rabbit blinded with stinging rain. We're boys pulling wings from sparrows, obviously nonchalant. We spend her like sailors on benders, ignoring her desperate eyes. She's kidnapped for the intangible joyride. She's dropped in the vestigial ditch. How quickly we tire of our toys. It gets dark. Oh, it gets dark in here fast. We are pushing her past her prime. We shout petrochemical lies. Time sticks in our in indecent throats. It gets dark, it gets dark, it gets dark here fast. And where were we when the lights went out? Where were we? To the Pacific. To her we belong. She holds no wrong-headed notion of justice. She builds no concrete tomb for our lungs. She forces us to feed on no poison. She hangs on us from no twisted tree. She rids us of no personal medfly. She plants no, she plants no bomb in our gut. She crushes no skull for freedom. She nails us not to the ground. She studies us not into extinction. Her changes are slower than rivers. History melts in her mouth. She'd deliver us from evil if we'd let her. 
how long have we been lost? And where were we when the lights went out? It's dark. It's dark. It gets dark in here fast. To the Pacific, you are bluer than our insignificant eyes. You are saltier than the tears we, we cried when we heard you might die of our neglect. We're killing you with exquisite indifference. You've washed our feet with your grief. We're gathered on the courthouse steps. We're bargaining one more plea. We're praying they'll spare you for, from us. Our blood is something your name, our, our blood is screaming your name. We're tearing up the deed to your being. We'll love you more deeply than death. We're, prepa we're prepared to pay the better price. We'll rip the tainted needles from our veins. Our blood is screaming, is screaming your name. We're about to become more serious. Where were you when the lights went out? To the Pacific. Older than unbearable wisdom, shrinking like the pointless death of thought, caught in the firestorm in our heads, tattooing the sacred skin of night, pounding in our hopeful bodies, breathing us in and out, shouting hosannas under Orion, drench us with unquenchable lies. Your waves are breaking deep inside. Your blood is roaring in our ears. You are dreaming us awake. Make us feel taller than trees. Dance us in your pagan arms. Your drums are beating on our shores. We're comprehending what you'd have us do. We're sounding louder alarms. We long to be truer believers. We'll be strong in our will to prevail. And we belong. We belong. We belong to you. It's to you that we belong. You've made your mark on our souls. But it's dark in here. Don't let the lights go out. We're, a, we're about to become more serious. Don't let the light disappear. Don't ever let the light disappear. One more round of applause for SA, please. Um, so one thing I've been very cognizant of direct as, as in my role as director here beyond Baroque, and I think a few of you have heard me say this over the years, is uh, sort of an intergenerational transfer that happens in this space. Uh, I'm significantly younger than um, you know, the first couple of founding generations of Beyond Baroque. Uh, in my time here, I tried to bring on some staff and new artists who are themselves significantly younger than me. And so it's for that reason that uh, I'm particularly grateful to, to Frank uh, for establishing this fellowship, because one of the things I'd like to see at Beyond Baroque is uh, that sense of experimentation continue to be here and continue to be out in the world that I think was the hallmark of Linda and, and a number of other artists associated with Beyond Baroque. Um, you know, there's a picture, one of the things I love about Frank, he's got these like, pictures of Linda and him. And like one of those pictures is Linda in corpse paint chopping off Alice Cooper's head on stage as part of a tour she did with Alice Cooper. Uh, you know, and that's, that to me represents a lot of, of what I'm talking about is, uh, you know, I want, I, want a, I want this to be a space for artists um, that are weird and um, unsettling and chop heads off from time to time. Yes. Um, exactly. I mean, someone's going to come chop off my head in a second. Um, happens every week. Um, but we got a huge number of applications for this fellowship. Uh, and they were actually, many of them were just astonishingly high quality poets uh, and performers. And so I'm very gratified to know that there are so many good writers out there, younger generation. Um, but 
it was also very clear that we had uh, a very, very, very exceptional candidate for the fellowship uh, in the person we ended up selecting, Abby Page. And so I'm really thrilled to welcome them to the stage um, and to see everything that they will do uh, throughout the course of this fellowship and well beyond. Uh, a lot of people get their start here at Brown Broke and they just go go on. They're like, uh, you know, shooting stars out there. And so um, I'll just tell you a little bit about Abby and then I'll, I'll bring them up to the stage. Abby Page is a Jamaican-American interdisciplinary writer, filmmaker, and performer. The creative critical theoretical practice explores the unimaginable metaphysics of black livingness. They graduated from Brown University with a BA in Africana Studies and Literary Arts with honors as a Mellon, Ways, Mellon Mays undergraduate research fellow. They're pursuing an MFA in creative writing and film and video at Cal Arts, where they also work as a peer writing tutor and a teaching assistant. They're a recipient of the Truman Capote Literary Trust Fellowship and the Ethel Robinson Award for Creative Re Research, as well as a member of Phi Beta Kappa and the House of Glitter Performance Lab. Please, everyone, welcome the inaugural Linda J. Albertano Fellow, Abby Page. <laughs> I'm Abby. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, I'm really excited about it. I didn't know Linda personally, but um, getting to see so many like archival images and like hearing so many amazing performances of her work, I feel very honored to be yeah able to help carry on her legacy. Um, cool. So I guess I'll read some poems now. <laughs> B. Jenkins on my bookshelf, a triptych. One, my territory sunflowers, full bloom in the piano guts. Don't press on me, baby. Pluck me, baby. Pluck me. Put your fingers in my rib cage and jazz me. Reconstruct a childhood memory of mine. Put yourself in the corner of it so that I've always carried you with me. And I'm wailing, honey. I'm wailing as you reach up slowly and caress my smooth, damp petals. I'm lingering on your fingertips if you can get down with the waning blues note. Disjointed harmony between lung capacity and vocal fry. God, I'm so full this morning. My flesh hums for you, darling. Two. Sister, sister, let me tell you something. I've met someone who sleeps with me but never touches me. And God, ain't that just holy. I'm between break and secret here. Between break and secret here. And I can only tilt my head upwards, close my eyes in reverence at the basement ceiling. A sunflower grows out the concrete. Three. If you press on me, baby, with seven fingers instead of five, it grinds me up. And you'll eat that dirt, of course, because all dirt roads taste of salt. And don't you know, God is change. So, of course, no furious protest here, baby. I'm unfolding if you want to hold me. A risky one. I'll coat your hands and give you something to draw with. This isn't a love poem. 
I've never felt such a thing. I mean, the love poem, of course. No, no, no. This, this is architecture. This is where bodies go when they rot. This is where sunflowers germinate. This is what they call music, honey. The wages of colonial destruction. This is my belly, my belly of the world. And before you know it, I've swallowed you up fully. You're a ball in my stomach waiting to come out of my womb. But I won't give it to you anymore. No, 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 no. No more breath of life from me anymore. If you want to fuck me in my intellect, you're going to have to narrativize and narrativize me only. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, dear God, do you ever feel like an astronaut that's been spin out, sent out into deep space on a solo mission and the only thing connecting you back to Earth is this really, really, really long piece of string, but it, the string is fraying just out of your reach and it hasn't broken yet, but you're pretty sure that it's going to break, but it hasn't yet, so you keep stretching your fingertips out trying to reach the broken part of it, but you keep seeing the distant planet Earth being crushed by your hands over and over and over again and you're worried that your mom is going to get mad at you for destroying all of civilization but you can't even hear her voice anyway because she's so 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 far away and it's all super lonely but super freeing at the same time because this is the first time you can sing Beyonce's listen without everyone laughing at how tone deaf you are and you feel bigger than everything but also super small at the same time like like small like the blood atoms that make up blood vessels and teeth and especially the blood atoms that spill over your teeth when you brush your teeth too hard but so 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 big you feel like your teeth could crush mountain tops and cause volcanoes to rise in the deep sea and you can't let the string go because you'll float off forever and ever but you already feel like you're this giant microscopic ghost sitting on the outside of your mom's ear on earth being swatted at by hands like in the same way the string moves when you kick your feet out in order to stretch your hands to the broken part but your limbs won't stop tingling because it's because you're so cold but it's a warm kind of cold like an ice water coming out of your eyes and stinging your cheeks in the desert heat kind of cold like i'll hold you close and keep you kind kind of cold yeah i feel that way too sometimes <laughs> yours always abby four years old <laughs> Dear God, Octavia Butler, when you said make a place that is your opposite, anticipate your outside, feel movement before it happens, and do the reverse upside down, inside out, retreat so far inside yourself that you come out the other end. When 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 you were saying said that, did you know that yesterday I cut chunks of my baby afro off with mama's sewing scissors and began shoving fistfuls of it down my throat and then began to chew on my fingers and my wrists and my forearms and suddenly I was in my stomach my womb stomach and then my brother found my mess and started eating it and mama didn't know for a long time that I was in my brother in his stomach and so when my black holes expand I am slowly but surely rupturing him too seeping from the pores in his skin and is that how singularities are made yours always Abby four years old <laughs> Dear God, Anna Martine Whitehead. Ooh, me too, me too, me too. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I, I, I too am the undead. I too feel sick and hobble about and scare everyone who sees me. I too become we too and do so infinitely. And I know this because yesterday I pulled mama out from between my teeth because I was mad at her. I'm we hungry, God. I'm we hungry. Yours always, Abby, four years old. <laughs> Dear God, Amber Jamila Musser, Dear God, how come you were br brothers with Judas if he was so mean to you? Did he love you? Did he love you? Was he just a more plus less than one to make you possible? Did he love you? Is that why? Dear God, Mama. Dear God, Audrey Lord. Dear God, Tisa Bryant. 
Dear God, Pastor Melba! Dear God, Christina Sharp! Dear God, Maya Angelou! Dear God, Gabrielle Seville! Um, dear God, Alexis Pauline Gums! Dear God, Nina Simone! Dear God, um, dear God, do you ever feel hungry? If not, when not? How do you know you're alive? Yours always, Abby, four years old. <laughs> Awesome, and then this is the last piece. <laughs> Wind up teeth five slash eight, a triptych. After Clarice Lispector's character Joanna in Near to the Wild Heart. One, the certainty that evil is my calling, thought Joanna. She felt a perfect animal inside her, full of contradictions, of selfishness, and vitality. I, I, I am, was, bursting forth, black skin peeling back, dropping in chunks. Am was serpent, silver scale, and banished from Eden. Am was kakakin folk, girl husband, boy wife, nod on ribs to be become sin eater. Am was sinking six year old teeth into a white boy's palm in my kindergarten class for stealing my favorite pink crayon. Blood knowledge spilling out between his lifeline and love line. Chunk of man child on tongue. What holds the body together? Mama says Am was vicious vitality. Am was the strangest creature she's ever met. Am was insisting, insisting in sepient incisors. Am was sinking into the scalp of my first crush in our neighborhood swimming pool, butting black breasts against his alabaster back, fighting his neck into the crux of my elbow. Choke and dull, quick thumping. Am was eight and unafraid of drowning, just emptiness. Consider me hungry. Two, how after all to split time, Christina Sharp in the wake. I, I, I am was sinking out of a stranger's womb, crying red, two taut teeth. Like everyone else, how boring. <laughs> Am was drowning the doctor with my blood magma, sizzling gleam of savagery in my eye, him petrified and snips, yet phantom umbilical cord uncut. Am was four and swallowing myself whole and swallowing mama whole and swallowing grandma whole. Am was 14 and in the church pew at my aunt's wake. Mama sharp nails digging at the flesh, bulging on the black of the back of my hand, which had held the torn children's Bible on my nightstand under a book with Harley Quinn orgasming on the cover. Am was 11 and home alone, testing torrid kisses on beautiful books in our cramped hallway, trips and bends and black toe backwards, falls and heated echoes of some other ancient mother calling out for me, hungry. Three, I'm looking at the little girl bleeding out and it's like I'm looking in a mirror, Aqui Akpakwasili, Bronx Gothic. Am was bleeding from my black pussy for the first time alone in the fifth grade girl's bathroom. Am was shoving fists down own throat, reaching for, am I, am I, am I supposed to clean all this shit up? Am was four and swallowing myself whole and swallowing mama whole and swallowing grandma whole and ten and mama says and nine and my thick thighs are and one in my birth mothers and six in my cracking teeth and bre and 14 in my breasts and eight and gasping for desire and <gasps> am I <gasps> am I <gasps> am I <gasps> 
Hi, mama. Hi, baby. I watch and you scrub white counters in the kitchen, sing gospel as something to feed on. Mama, honey, mama, honey, sing again, sing again. Thank you. Please, another round of applause for Abby. And for all of our readers as well. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I think Frank wanted to say a few closing words, but we just really glad to have you here. Feel free to hang out, enjoy the reception. Um, and I think Frank will just bring us home. So, Frank. Real quick. Two things. Number one, if you didn't get a button, there's a table out there with buttons on them for everybody. Happy birthday, Linda Albert Hall. Okay. Yeah. Number two, hold on to your seats. But I talked to Linda the last few days several times. She's going to be, she's here with us tonight. Yeah. That's it. She's here. <laughs> <laughs> A 10 point plan for female emancipation. Left, right, left, right, one. Never pick up the tab. At least not until the earnings gap has closed. Remember, money is power and you need yours to purchase assets. Oil wells, racehorses, blue chip portfolios. Left, right, left, right, two. Take a tip from Zsa Zsa Gabor. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Left, right, left, right, three. Equal rights. Did you say equal rights? We don't need no stinking equality. We're not gonna settle for less than a buck for every 50 cents they get. Left, right, left, right, four. Draft women. Men already know how to fight, and they'll think twice before raping a green beret. Left, right, left, right, five. Gun control for men. Females only should be allowed to carry weapons. Let's make the streets safe to walk again. Left, right, left, right, six. And about walking those streets. Throw the Johns in jail and give hookers respectable high-paying jobs in the community. Left, right, left, right, seven. Women, don't have their babies unless you can afford to. Almost everyone gets divorced. Hardly anyone gets child support payments. Left, right, left, right, eight. Make your hip political boyfriend help with the dishes. Don't be misled by self-serving rhetoric about the revolution happening first. Left, right, left, right, nine. Elect a female president. Come on, fellow women. 
sneak out and vote. We're a clear-cut majority. Let's rule the galaxy and all its inhabitants. Okay. Left, right, left, right, 10. Only merry men with part-time jobs. You'll have an income from the assets you've bought with the money you saved by not going Dutch anymore. And the children need their fathers at home. Children need their fathers at home. Experts. We are not the petty bureaucrats of pleasure. We are the senators of Midnight Congress. We hold PhDs in pretty poses. We are priests perfumed and serene. We have the hands that heal. Let us handle your emotional portfolios. We're the Fortune 500 of Black Lace. We are the experts. Our time is valuable. We're the secret service of champagne and roses, the shock troops of sensuality. Our operatives are everywhere. We slide bamboo slivers of love underneath the fingernails of your psyches. You don't even know you've been hit. Wounding you is our full-time occupation. We could fix it with a smile, but we decline. Can you afford us? We are the experts. Our time is valuable. The Gold Miner Manifesto. Good evening. Linda Albertana was unable to be with us tonight, so I'm appearing in her place. I'm Sugar Reynolds, the editor of Gold Miner magazine. Gold Miner, the magazine for ambitious women, is a hybrid of Playboy and Forbes. It's an iconoclastic neo feminist political philosophy. It's a state of mind that can be achieved only by concentrating on Gordon Getty's annual income and multiplying by two. We are gold miners. We believe that the orderly transfer of wealth from the male sector to the female sector can be achieved through corporate sabotage, palimony, and stealth. Secret slip from love drunk lips. We are gold miners. Our weapons are fear, surprise, and massive settlements of divorce. Every dollar earned in court by the ex-Mrs. Johnny Carson adds a dollar to the economic weight of women as a whole. We are gold miners. We spit on the concept of equal wages for equal work. We're dedicated to the proposition that we have an inalienable right to earn twice as much dough for our labors as they do for theirs. Let the pendulum swing in our direction for a few hundred years before centering. Then, on our cross-country flights, we'll be nurtured by perky, smiling stewards catering to our every whim, and the buff bodies of nubile boys draped across the hoods of sexy roadsters in magazine auto ads will make our credit cards throb with unquenchable joy. We are gold miners. We believe that a man's erotic charms are most provocatively displayed when he's photographed on a bed of gold bullion, naked, revealing those twin parts of himself so alluring to women, the weight of his net worth and the net worth of his weight. Think of Gordon Getty's annual income and multiply by two. Picture Donald Trump with a staple through his navel. You're almost there. You're very close to a state of perfect gold miner 
own. We are gold miners. We assert that beauty queens, movie starlets, and those women heretofore known to an ignorant and vulnerable public only as bimbos are on the front lines in a guerrilla war being waged surreptitiously against select members of the privileged gender. You will meet our lieutenants in pricey little fern bars, in the cushioned hallways of your executive suites, on the casting couches of your television evangelists. We are gold miners! Jessica Hahn is the captain of our drill team. Fawn Hall is replacing Ted Koppel. Marlo Maples has kidnapped your reputation and is holding it for ransom. And the second Mrs. Stallone has become gold miner of the decade by divesting Sylvester of six million large ones in record time. We are gold miners. This is a piece for an invented sign language. Jazz and jurisprudence. Hooked on the temptations. Oh, joy. You're the one they warned me about. Delicious and surreptitious joy. Now I've got a cruel jazz Joan. Crazy, crazy finger popping joy. Sing me like a neon jukebox. Joy, oh joy. Your body, speaking braille, whispers danger. Sing me, sing me like a midnight jukebox joy. Somewhere in an alternate universe. I read you blindly. Joy, joy. Like a slow lawyer searching through fine print. Sing me, incredible finger pop and joy! Martha lived with Jack for five years. Now she calls him nearly every day. But he no longer has eyes for her. He wants to spend more time with me to work on us. Oh, 
tied up inside over Sean. <laughs> whose heart is being broken by Patrice. Who's being dragged around by the nose by Mark. Who calls Jack nearly every day. Who wants to spend more time with me to work on us. But I'm all tied up inside. Oh! 
invited me in all night long. He said you were asleep. Bad sign. He asked me in all night long to talk. Bad sign. I could hear you sleeping all night long through the walls. He was a bad an engine was idling all night long in my chest. Bad sign. I wanted to change clothes all night long, but I couldn't get it right. It was a bad sign. Your friend talked to me all night long through the door. He said, you and me, babe, all night long. I said my heart belongs to another. It was a bad sign. He said another's been stepping out on you, babe. All night long. Why not do the same? Bad sign. All right, I said, all night long. All night long, but you have more women. It's a bad sign. You have more 
you have. You. 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 Beloved, thou art incendiary. Thou sendest me up in sparks a hundred times a day. Thou makest me hum like a thousand buzzing phone lines yammering through dizzy night. When thou smilest upon me, I'm money in the bank. When thou snarlest, I am as a bad check bounced. <laughs> I cower in thy heart's darkest trash bin. Thou art the lion of La Cienega, the rose of Sherman Way. I love to lay eyes on thee. Thou ringest through me, sudden and bright as fresh champagne. My switchboard overloadeth. I love to taste the texture of thy skin. Thine eyes art interstellar. Beloved, thou art incendiary. Thou sendest me up in sparks. with the open heel. He really loves those slippers. He wears them to every tireless, sockless occasion he can think of. Like to nick the Greeks for tiny little cocktail onions or to sardis for beer. And pig's feet. Freud asked me what I thought it meant. I said, I didn't know, but I dreamed long ago I was a dinosaur detective rescuing a blonde from hideous grinning death. I looked a lot like Bogey. She was real grateful. She had lips like overripe tomatoes. I could hardly wait to sink my teeth into her. Boy! Imagine my surprise when I woke up and found out I was nothing but a skinny little girl in a pink flannel sleeping suit with a trapdoor bottom. 
I don't know what to think about the five o'clock shadow, though. A ten-point plan for female emancipation. Left, right, left, right, one. Never pick up the tab. At least not until the earnings gap has closed. Remember, money is power and you need yours to purchase assets. Oil wells, racehorses, blue chip portfolios. Left, right, left, right, two. Take a tip from Zsa Zsa Gabor. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Left, right, left, right, three. Equal rights. Did you say equal rights? We don't need no stinking equality. We're not going to settle for less than a buck for every 50 cents they get. Left, right, left, right, four. Draft women. Men already know how to fight, and they'll think twice before raping a green beret. Left, right, left, right, five. A 10-point plan for female emancipation. Left, right, left, right, one. Never pick up the tab. At least not until the earnings gap has closed. Remember, money is power and you need yours to purchase assets. Oil wells, racehorses, blue chip portfolios. Left, right, left, right, two. Take a tip from Zsa Zsa Gabor. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Left, right, left, right, three. Equal rights. Did you say equal rights? We don't need no stinking equality. We're not gonna settle for less than a buck for every 50 cents they get. Left, right, left, right, four. Draft women. Men already know how to fight. And they'll think twice before raping a green beret. Left, right, left, right, five. Gun control for men. Females only should be allowed to carry weapons. Let's make the streets safe to walk again. Left, right, left, right, six. And about walking those streets. Throw the Johns in jail and give hookers respectable high-paying jobs in the community. Left, right, left, right, seven. Women, don't have their babies unless you can afford to. Almost everyone gets divorced. Hardly anyone gets child support payments. Left, right, left, right, eight. Make your hip political boyfriend help with the dishes. Don't be misled by self-serving rhetoric about the revolution happening first. Left, right, left, right, nine. Elect a female president. Come on, fellow women. Sneak out and vote. We're a clear-cut majority. Let's rule the galaxy and all its inhabitants. Okay? Left, right, left. Right, 10. Only marry men with part-time jobs. You'll have an income from the assets you've bought with the money you saved by not going Dutch anymore. And the children need their fathers at home. Children need their fathers at home. <laughs>